Okay, I will start recording now. Recording in progress. Okay. Can you, you, you need to mute it. I have muted. So we will have echo here. Okay. It's down all the way. I don't know. And I've muted. Uh, reference in Zoom, reference audio, and, and you can mute there. Okay. We will solve these technical problems here. In audio, speakers. Everything says it's in So I will make the introduction and then <coughs> shut up and, and you will start. You want to speak from here? No, because I have the introduction here. <laughs> okay. Good morning, everybody. We have some small technical problems here, but I think we can survive. Today, uh, we will have the talk by Dr. Kelly. And she got the PhD from the University of Wisconsin. She will talk about, sorry, radio astronomy in the pre ska era. What can Aperitif do for you? Uh, she got the PhD from the University of Wisconsin, Madison, in 2011. Then uh, the PhD focused on environmentally driving galaxy evolution in galaxy groups and clusters. She did the first postdoc at the University of Cape Town in South Africa, where she worked on science commission of Karu Array Telescope, CAT-7, the precursor of Meerkat. Uh, more cat in Africans, in addition to being a cute wild animal. In 2014, she moved to the Netherlands for the second postdoc, uh, which was a joint position at the Captain Astronomical Institute in Groningen and Astron in the Netherlands Institute of Radio Astronomy. Then she worked on science commissioning of Apertif and executing the Apertif surveys. She moved uh, to here, Granada, at the IIA in, in last October and uh, to work for the SCAE coordination. She used Apertif data to test and expand the capability of the Spanish Prototype Science Regional Center being developed here. She's involved with, the, with the many of the large H1 survey of scale precursor and pathfinders, including Chiles, La Duma, Mighty, H1, Apertif, and Wallaby. And perhaps most interesting to the folks here, she's the co-survey working group lead for the WIV Apertif survey which uh, will do large IFO follow-up of 400 Apertif H1 detected galaxies. So thank you very much, Kelly. Uh, I will stop talking because this is really, <laughs> the echo here is annoying. So the floor is yours. Okay, can everyone hear me now? Hopefully without an echo. Um, if not, someone please turn on your camera and raise your hand. Um, thank you very much for that introduction. Uh, indeed, I'll tell you about uh, what Apertif can do for you and hopefully get you excited about um, using the survey data that's um, been released and uh, will come in the future. So uh, let's see. by way of a, an outline of what I'll talk about today, I'll give you an introduction to Apertif. I'll tell you about the science motivations and its capabilities. Um, I'll also tell you a little bit about uh, some of the data visualization that we're doing, which I'm giving you a preview of here on the right. Um, I'll discuss some recent very exciting results, and then I'll talk about uh, data release one and how you can access the data. Um, of course, uh, while I'm here presenting the surveys to you, there's actually a very large team of people that have made these surveys possible. Um, and I'll also point out that 
today I'm going to focus on the imaging science, but there's also a large time domain science team that has been very prolific in discovering fast radio bursts and publishing on their spectral and temporal properties. Um, I won't say anything about that science today, I'll focus on the imaging stuff, but just to let you know that it's there. So I can't tell you about Apertif without telling you about the West Bork Synthesis Radio Telescope. Uh, Westerbork has been operating in the Netherlands for more than 50 years now. Uh, it's an east-west array in the Netherlands, which consists of 14 25 meter dishes, 12 of which have uh, out, been outputted uh, in the last decade with phased array feeds. Um, and this is just to give you an idea of um, what those phase array feeds instruments look like. They're quite large. Um, the, the goal of uh, upgrading the instrumentation on Westerbork is really to increase the field of view. Um, the paths themselves, so phase array feeds or paths for short, um, are made up of 121 Vivaldi elements. And what we do is we take the signal from these elements, um, they're combined electronically uh, in order to be able to project up to 40 simultaneous beams on the sky, covering 300 megahertz of bandwidth. Uh, we call these beams compound beams. Um, and uh, this is to give you an idea of sort of what the survey, what a, what a single pointing footprint looks like on the sky using um, these paths. So originally the field of view was, um, uh, would be represented by beam zero at the center of the figure on the right. Um, and now all of a sudden, uh, by projecting 40 compound beams, we have a much larger area on the sky. Um, at 50% sensitivity, after you mosaic these compound beams together, you get an instantaneous field of view of about eight square degrees, making the telescope very efficient for conducting large sky surveys. Um, and when we record the data from uh, the paths, we record them at full polarization uh, and at resolutions that are appropriate for spectral line science. So as a result, we can actually effectively conduct three surveys at once, a continuum, a polarization, and a neutral hydrogen survey. And so to give you an idea of what kind of science we're interested in doing, uh, in the continuum, we can uh, detect star forming galaxies, um, giant radio galaxies and radio relics. Um, these are all of course in either free free emission or synchrotron emission. Um, we can also do H1 absorption line studies against bright continuum objects. Uh, in polarization, we can study the magnetic fields in the interstellar medium of galaxies, the magnetic fields in radio jets, also in the intergalactic medium and in our own Milky Way. And then in neutral hydrogen or in H1, which I'll say frequently, um, we're interested in studying stuff like the accretion and removal of gas in different environments, uh, environmental processing, and also looking at the resolved kinematics of galaxies and also studying um, faint galaxy populations, dwarf galaxies. So in the figure on the right, what I'm showing is NGC 891 um, in the optical. The contours are the continuum emission from the galaxy. The uh, lines uh, overlaying the contours are actually the direction of the magnetic field. Um, and then on top of that, you can also place, uh, you can also detect the total H1 in the galaxy. Um, and so here is the H1 now on top of those essentially three other images that show that NGC 891 has a very extended H1 disk and actually a lot of gas above and below the, the main disk of the galaxy. So this is just to really drive the point home that Apertif has a lot of commensality between these three um, capabilities. Uh, in fact, uh, in our imaging strategy, we actually have areas of the survey where we go to two different depths. Um, there is one that's uh, really the wide area extra galactic survey um, that covers uh, now 2,200 square degrees. Um, we observe each phase array feed pointing for somewhere between one and two sets of observations for 11 and a half hours. Um, and uh, we observe a smaller part of the sky, about 150 square degrees, uh, to uh, basically about three times that depth. We observe 10 times longer. And that's the Apertif medium deep um, survey. And the depths of these surveys are really driven by the science that we're interested in doing. So the wide area survey, the depths that we can achieve get down to about, um, if you're thinking in neutral atomic hydrogen, about one times 10 to the 20 per centimeter squared. What that allows you to do is detect the H1 disks of galaxies, the thin disks in particular. Um, and the medium deep survey uh, going three times deeper gets you down to a few times 10 to the 19 per centimeter squared. 
And that allows you to detect something like the thickness of galaxies, but also tidal debris um, for galaxies that are interacting, for example. Um, you can see tidal tails. Um, or for galaxies that are being ram pressure stripped in a cluster environment, that sort of thing. So you can actually uh, get to depths where you see um, the morphological signatures of processing. Um, I should also say that the, <clears throat> the depths aren't just driven by what we can do in H1, but in particular, for example, the, the wide area survey, that depth is also driven by what you can do with uh, low frequency surveys, such as uh, those done with LOFAR or LOTS. Um, and in fact, our depth is well matched in the continuum to see the same galaxies that LOFAR detects um, at 150 megahertz, uh, assuming a spectral index for sources of minus uh, 0.7. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about LOFAR and the complementarity between aperitif later, but just to give you kind of a um, flavor. Uh, the column densities that are colored on the left correspond to the same color contours on the right. So in the top, um, you can see NGC 891 again with its thin disk and thick disks. And then uh, in the bottom panel on the right, you can see three or four galaxies with a lot of um, intragroup H1 in there as well that would be detected by aperitif. Um, so as far as the footprint, what aperitif covers, um, on the left-hand side, what I'm doing is I'm showing uh, every galaxy with a redshift from the two mass redshift survey out to about say 200 megaparsecs um, uh, in blue. And I'm showing <clears throat> very nearby galaxies in orange. Um, and the open circles basically each represent a pointing of aperitif. So you can see that in the top left, this is uh, what an optical astronomer would think of as the spring sky. Um, in the bottom right is the fall sky. Um, and what you can see from the clustering of these blue points in particular is that we trace a lot of large scale structure um, in, within the aperitif pointings. Um, on the right hand side, you basically have the same map, but now the galaxies are gone and the uh, empty circles are colored yellow for the aperitif fields that um, in our sort of uh, super set of pointings, the ones colored in yellow, were observed in the wide area survey and the ones colored in red were covered, were covered in the medium deep survey. Um, in addition to sort of probing lots of uh, different uh, types of structures, both um, clusters and filaments and voids, there's also the footprints were chosen to have very good overlap with um, ancillary uh, data with other surveys. So for example, um, the lot survey with LOFAR, which its area, it, ultimately, it will be all sky, but sort of their first data release is kind of outlined uh, in green in the upper left. It has very good, uh, Aperitif has very good coverage with uh, the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, which is also 100% um, covered in the upper left. Um, and also other complementary Sloan surveys like Manga, which I'll talk about a bit later. Um, it also has good coverage with some deep fields such as Herschel Atlas, which is really in the top left. Um, that kind of covers coma um, and uh, it's the large scale structure around that. Um, and the medium deep survey also covered the Perseus Pisces cluster, which is in the lower right. So there's lots of interesting large scale structure there as well. Um, and then of course we have complementarity with all sorts of large sky, uh, all sky surveys, I should say. So to give you an idea of um, what Apertif can do, um, before the, phase ray feed upgrade to Westerbork, the field of view would look something like this, um, <clears throat> about half a square degree on a side. Um, with our 40 compound beam now, we can do something like this. This is uh, what Apertif sees in a single pointing. Uh, this is a continuum image. Uh, the total sky coverage here is about eight square degrees, like I said. But of course, this is a big survey, so we have to tile these pointings together, which means that the total amount of unique survey area per pointing is a little bit less. It's about six and a half square degrees. Um, you can see that there are thousands of objects in here. And uh, it's a little bit sad. This isn't necessarily the most exciting fields because uh, it's mostly point sources, but uh, in other fields, we also see very dramatic uh, um, uh, like radio jets and things like that. Um, uh, before I show you the next slide, I'll just sort of, uh, you know, direct your eye to one particular location like this, and then I'll show you what the polarization products look like. 
So this is what you get. You can see that there are a lot fewer sources in polarization than there are in H1. Um, but what's interesting is that um, Apertif is actually going to be, or is very good for doing, for example, rotation measures of studying the Milky Way magnetic field. Apertif detects about 21 polarized sources per square degree. This is in contrast to sort of the next best uh, rotation measure survey, which might be NVSS, um, which only gets about three uh, polarized sources per square degree. Um, so you can see that there are lots of point sources in here. That's great. The, around some of the brightest ones, you see rings. Those are actually artifacts um, from calibration that we're still working on improving with our next generation data calibration. Um, but you can also see some large scale structure in here that's kind of fuzzy stuff, especially to the left. Um, and uh, this is real structure from within our own Milky Way. This is not something I'm an expert in by any means, but this is stuff that other people have studied. For example, um, Brian Gainsler and his group have studied the depolarization channels in the, in the Milky Way. Um, and so this is sort of caused by uh, um, the turbulent structure in our own ISM and the magnetic fields. Um, and in fact, just to, I think this is interesting. Um, I've also grabbed a, a WISE 22 micron image so that you can see what the galactic cirrus looks like in this field. So this is sort of the dust from the, from the galaxy in that same field. Um, of course, so I've covered continuum and polarization. There is also H1. And so now what I'm showing is actually uh, in sort of the, the pale colors in the background, this is a, a DSS2 red image. Um, and I'm showing in blue contours on top, uh, H1 spectral line detections. Um, I realize that they're a little bit hard to see on this, especially if you have a small screen, but there are actually 36 H1 detections in this, uh, in this field. So um, just to emphasize again, that we got all of this simultaneously. It's a lot of work to reduce the data and to mosaic it, but we get it in a single pointing of 11 and a half hours, which is pretty cool. Um, and to give you, you know, to really drive home this point of data quality, um, this is an image of a, a not very random field in the sky <laughs> um, from uh, the NRAO VLA Sky Survey, or NVSS, which you might be familiar with. It has a resolution of 45 arc seconds. Um, it is really a go-to survey for many people if they want to know if, you, if they have a radio counterpart for whatever object they're studying. Um, in addition to NVSS, there's also the first survey. This is of the exact same field. Um, but first is a much higher resolution survey. It's five arc seconds. Um, and so you basically get the brightest point sources in something like first. Um, and any sort of diffuse emission is totally resolved out. Um, but with Apertif in that same field, you get this. And so now all of a sudden, Apertif has sort of an, uh, an intermediate um, resolution. It's about 15 arc seconds. Um, but uh, because of its depth, uh, and resolution, you get, uh, because of its depth, you get the surface brightness sensitivity to um, diffuse uh, emission in galaxies, um, as well as like the depth to detect fainter sources and uh, the resolution, better resolution than you would get from NVSS. Um, this is actually uh, what I'm showing you. The not so random field is M101. And uh, on the right-hand side, this is just sort of a first pass at, at producing H1 contours, but I really wanted to highlight the continuum aspect of it. So this is what they look like side by side, um, and you can really see the improvement. Um, so my point here is that if you are um, doing science in which you're curious whether or not your object has a radio counterpart, um, consider looking in Apertif. Um, so this is what the the, Continuum looks like. Um, I wanted to say a little bit about what the spectral line data looks like because this is really what my specialty is. Um, the H1 data, of course, looks slightly different. Rather than images, what we create are data cubes. And um, the volume of the data cubes coming out of Apertif is pretty enormous. So for a single pointing, um, you have 40 compound beams. Each compound beam, the uh, bandwidth has been chopped up. Um, into several uh, intermediate sized cubes. In this case, um, I'm counting the four nearest cubes, uh, nearest in terms of their frequency and their uh, recessional velocity for the H1 line. But 40 compound beams times four cubes, um, plus the, the dirty cubes in order to clean the data is about a terabyte um, for a single 11 and a half hour pointing. Um, a single cube with one, within one of these uh, 
uh, compound beams is about 500 million pixels, about 99.999% of which is empty space. <laughs> And so the challenge that I personally am undertaking here at the IAA with help from the Spanish prototype SRC is actually to do source finding within these cubes. Um, and so here I've just on the right graphically represented what that data volume looks like uh, and uh, a few thrown a few galaxies in there to show you what kind of stuff I'm looking for. It turns out though that uh, we can actually do this and are being quite successful. Um, I've actually found thousands of H1 detected sources in just a small fraction of the total uh, aperitif survey data. Um, and for each source, I'm able to characterize their H1 properties and produce images that allow us to start doing science. Um, and so, uh, in fact, this is an example of a galaxy that uh, I detected and the data products um, that I'm trying to produce for aperitif and for others uh, to, to do science. Um, the software that I wrote to produce these data products was actually uh, just released about two weeks ago. Uh, it's called the Sophia Image Pipeline, um, and you can download it on GitHub if, uh, if you're curious. Um, the source finding aspect uh, for the neutral atomic hydrogen picks out individual sources, but um, one of the great things about Apertif is we're mosaicing very large fields of view. And so um, we can actually look at galaxies within their larger environment. This is what I'm really interested in. So hopefully someday I'll come back and give a talk to you about galaxy groups and clusters and, and the gas processing that happens within them. Um, but what I'm showing here is actually one of my favorite gas rich groups that we've uh, discovered with Apertif. And in fact, I'm just gonna zoom in on this one very small part of it. Um, this actually contains three galaxies um, and they look something like this individually. Um, the uh, I'm going to pause this. Let's see if I can pause this movie at just the right spot. Nope. Okay. <laughs> um, basically, it starts backwards. So there is when it's lined up with the figures. Um, you can see that the this data has been smoothed a little bit. And what you can see is that in addition to the three galaxies that are detected that have clear optical counterparts, there's a lot of H1 gas that wasn't even necessarily picked up by source finding or that doesn't have an optical counterpart that's between them. Um, and so uh, we can do the source finding, but if you look at the larger environment and also even more powerfully, if you start to look at the galaxies in three dimensions in the sort of the native uh, data that uh, sort of the native format that this data comes in, you can actually see a lot more connections between galaxies and start to understand what's going on with them evolutionarily. Um, this uh, figure, or this movie, I should say, was made with a software call, called Slicer Astro, which was written by a PhD student, uh, David Apunzo, and is also publicly available um, on GitHub. It's great for um, H1 data, but you could also use it, for example, with CO data, um, anything that comes uh, in a FITS cube. Um, and it will automatically uh, try and calculate what the contour should be so that you can easily visualize your data. Um, but it also has advanced 3D modeling tools embedded within it. So um, uh, for those that know the jargon, you can use, for example, 3D Barolo to do modeling of galaxy rotation curves within, within the software itself. Um, so that's one way to visualize the data. Um, a second way is actually using virtual reality software. And uh, some people may have wandered into the lunchroom sometime last week while uh, myself and my student were playing around with this. Um, this is my, my very excellent student who's um, uh, a master's student here, uh, Clara, um, trying to explore a data cube. You can see that she's got a headset on um, and she's got uh, yeah, handheld things in her hands. And she's actually uh, on the screen behind her, you can see what she sees of a cube with uh, those three galaxies in it. And um, the, um, what are these things called? I don't know, the paddles, whatever she's holding. Um, <laughs> joysticks, yeah. Um, allow you to zoom in and zoom out of the cube and also manipulate stuff like uh, the color map, um, the relative intensity, the scaling within the, um, the cube to sort of better visualize um, what's going on. It also allows you to, it's a very immersive experience. It allows you to also walk around the data, um, 
which is which is pretty cool. Um, the I should say uh, I'm going to take 30 seconds to to have a small rant uh, for any of the important people who are sitting here listening. The <laughs> um, we actually have only been able to do this recently because we're running it on Clara's personal computer. Uh, I arrived here in October. We had discussions about VR in sort of November. We wanted to order our own laptop to be able to do this uh, with the, you know, that had all the right specs in December, but we weren't able to do that because it was outside the normal ordering of, uh, you know, equipment. So we ordered it in February and now it's May and it still hasn't arrived yet. Uh, and so at this point in time, about a month ago, I'd sort of forgotten that we'd even tried to do this. <laughs> Um, so it would be great if somehow the procurement process was more responsive to uh, our needs. Um, but, uh, okay, rant over. Um, my point is that this software exists. Um, it's under active development. Uh, I'm a close collaborator with the, the person who is um, leading this in Cape Town um, and uh, under discussion about what sort of things we'd like to um, incorporate into the software to make it jump from not just something that's cool to play with to something where we can actually do really good in-depth um, scientific analysis. Um, it's very powerful for radio spectral line cubes like the neutral hydrogen from Apertif um, or from Meerkat or from other telescopes. It's also very good uh, for looking at simulations, uh, you know, for example, large cosmological simulations. But one could imagine that the, the VR software also has the potential for growth for example, visualizing other kinds of data cubes, whether it's Muse or optical IFU cubes or other. Um, and I think that uh, there's a lot of existing expertise here um, that uh, we could tap into. And so if you have any interest in um, either playing with my data just for fun or looking at your own data, then I would encourage you to, to reach out. Um, and of course, there's also lots of potential for astronomy outreach. Um, so to give you kind of a little bit more of an idea, so like what you can do, this is now inside um, the VR software. You can, this is uh, uh, Tom selecting a galaxy, kind of orienting himself around it. Um, you can also make uh, plots. So he's uh, taken the full data cube. He's now cropped it around this one galaxy. Um, in addition to loading the data itself, if you have a mask, which tells you, for example, where the galaxies are within the cube. You can also load masks. Um, and uh, within the area that's been selected, uh, it can also do on the fly sort of integration to make moment maps. And uh, so for example, on the top is a total intensity moment zero map and the bottom is a, a velocity moment one map. And you can also manually play with the thresholds to improve your maps, which is what, what Tom is doing now. Um, and so, uh, yeah, you can interact live with the data. Um, this software is also available publicly. Uh, it's called iDavy. Um, you can get it at that website. Um, and basically what you need in order to play with it is a headset, uh, a computer with the appropriate graphics card, um, and what else? Uh, a Steam account, and uh, I think that's about it. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about the, so, so that's all cool. That's sort of what the data is, how we are visualizing it, that sort of thing. Let me tell you a little bit about the science that we're doing with Apertif um, that, we've, uh, that we've published, which is kind of, you know, the most exciting first stuff that you can do. The first paper that came out was actually um, uh, about this extreme intra hour variable source that was discovered. Um, Previously, there were only four known sources that varied on timescales of less than a day. Um, what we're actually detecting here is scintillation within um, our own galaxy. So what this requires is a background source that has micro arc second radio structure um, and foreground sub AU scale within our ISM. Um, and the light passing from that micro arc second radio structure through the sub AU scale ISM um, causes twinkling. And because Westerbork has this very particular array structure being east-west, when you reduce data and try and image it, you get artifacts that are sort of these radial 
um, beams originating from this source. Um, and so uh, this was, we actually discovered this during science verification um, and went, oh, hey, what is this? Um, on the right-hand side in the top left, what you see is its uh, light curve. And we continued to monitor the source over the course of a year. Um, and so you can see its light curve changing, which is just basically due to our motion around the earth. Um, and so this is either, uh, there's a bit of degeneracy in the model. This is either basically um, uh, ISM structure, either very close to us, uh, perhaps like at the distance of the edge of our own solar system, or else um, there's a possibility that it's uh, structure due to a, a very bright um, star a bit, several parsecs away. Um, and uh, it turns out Apertif has now discovered 20 or so such twinkling sources in the period of about, say, 20 months, whereas four were previously known over the course of, say, three decades. Um, so it's very exciting. And with more sources, we can actually start to probe the, the ISM within the solar neighborhood. Um, the next discovery uh, was actually the serendipitous discovery of an OH mega maser. Um, this was actually spoken about by Haley Roberts at a seminar a couple of weeks ago. Um, and so I'll just say that uh, we discovered an OH mega maser in uh, a very bright ULERG, which is, uh, which is also appears to be a merging set of galaxies. Um, we detected the main lines of the OH mega maser. Um, and we also were able to attempt to measure the, um, the brightness of one of the satellite lines as well um, at 16, 12 megahertz. And the implications for the, uh, well, if you can measure the line ratios between these two, then it has implications for what the um, physical properties of, of the maze and gas are. Um, so that's cool. I'll leave it at that. Um, most recently, uh, we had a paper published uh, that looked at the characteristics of polarized sources um, in about 60 square degrees of aperitif data. Um, this is uh, where I sort of got my earlier statistics about uh, the number of polarized sources per square degree and how aperitif will be very effective at um, doing rotation measures for studying our own Milky Way. Um, in addition, uh, there's a pipeline that's been developed which uh, produces these images on the bottom. So uh, we can have total power images, um, but plotted on top of that, you can have the polarized intensity. Um, going to the right, uh, this, is a, this is for a resolved source. Um, you can have the, the rotation measure. Uh, you can also have the fractional polarization for an object. Um, and then you can also retrieve stuff like WISE imaging uh, and other all sky surveys. So there's also pan stars and Sloan imaging and that sort of thing. Um, and so Bjorn Adabar, uh, who's in Germany, he uh, characterized the host galaxies of many of these polarized sources and looked at those um, statistics, many of which are dominated by uh, radio loud AGN. Um, in addition, uh, I mentioned already that Apertif has very good synergy with the LOFAR surveys uh, and LOTS at 150 megahertz. Um, it's particularly good for um, looking at the spectral index of uh, resolved sources, for example. So uh, you can study the energetics of radio galaxies and the age of the synchrotron emission um, coming out of these, uh, these radio jets. So I've just got two examples here. Um, one is from Morganti et al. Um, of a, a galaxy cluster that's actually in the Lachman hole. Um, ABEL 1132. On the right-hand side, this is a paper that's about to be resubmitted, or I think it actually has been resubmitted, um, that was looking at uh, uh, a low-energy uh, radio AGN in uh, a ULERG uh, Markarian 273. Uh, this is grad student who's up in uh, at the University of Toronto again. Um, and so you can see the radio contours, and then on the bottom you can see the aperitif and low-far spectral index that are derived from um, the respective images. Um, those are just sort of a, a flavor of the results coming out. So hopefully um, that'll get you excited as they might relate to your own science. Um, looking a little bit more towards the future, um, as was mentioned in my bio, there is the Weave Aperitif survey that's coming up very quickly. Um, Weave is uh, going to be on the WHT on La Palma. Um, and Weave Apertif is a dedicated large IFU follow-up of 400 H1 detected galaxies with Apertif. Uh, Weave is expected to have first light and begin science verification later this year. Um, and so 
uh, I'll just sort of show a preview of what the data can look like um, by using Mongo, which is another large IFU survey as an example. So on the left, what I'm showing is um, the H1 contours on a, on a galaxy, uh, on an optical galaxy, an optical image of the galaxy, sorry. And on the bottom left, I'm showing the, the velocity map from the H1. Um, and it turns out this is a galaxy that was observed by Manga. Um, and so the hexagonal pattern in each of the images is uh, the field of view of Manga, as, and you can see as compared to the H1. Um, and so with, by combining H1 and optical IFU, you can now get both resolved um, measures of not only the gas, but of course, what's going on with the stars and the ionized gas within these galaxies. Um, this is nice because you can see that the, um, uh, the stellar velocity matches up very well with the H1 velocity uh, in the lower left, but of course the H1 extends much more, much further out in, in the galaxy. Um, yeah, so uh, to tell you a little bit, uh, so now hopefully I've gotten you excited. Let me tell you how you can actually access the data. Um, so Apertif DR1 was actually released uh, in October of 2021, so now almost a, a year and a half ago. Um, we tried to make the data available as quickly as possible um, for all of the data that had passed um, validation metrics. Um, so, you know, that we weren't concerned about uh, not deriving good properties from the images that we were releasing effectively. Um, there are two companion papers that are in prep. Um, one is a description of the data release and the the validation process, uh, that's by Petsy Adams. Um, the second is a, a continuum source catalog by Alexander Kutkin. Um, the continuum source catalog also may be interesting that um, it will include cross matches with both LOFAR and uh, NVSS. Um, and these are about to be submitted, uh, I think the goal is May 12th. Um, so those will be coming in the next couple months. In the meantime, um, it is actually possible to go to the Astron website and get a very detailed description of um, how the data release was done. Um, and so much of the information that will be coming out in the papers is already available uh, on the Astron website. Um, how to get access to the data? Uh, oh, I should say, so what I'm showing here in this is actually the footprint of DR1. And on the left, this is an example of a, a radio continuum galaxy with a crazy jet. Um, and on the right is uh, a galaxy that I showed earlier um, with this very extended H1 tail, just to sort of show you the, some interesting things that we see. Um, you can get access to the data by going to vo.astron.nl. Um, what it has actually, uh, it actually has a bunch of things there. Um, so uh, you can also get access to the lots, uh, the LOFAR uh, images that have been released, uh, DR1, DR2. Um, and then at the bottom of this, those purple highlighted links, uh, you can get access to the upper teeth data. Um, it's divided into the continu continuum imaging, the spectral uh, H1 spectral line cubes and the polarization images and cubes. Um, if you click on, for example, how to get the polarization images and cubes, you'll get something like this. Um, many of these search parameters are maybe a, a bit more useful for someone who's already familiar with the survey, um, but uh, you can search by position. Um, so in this case, in my example, I'm going to search around M101. Uh, I've already shown you many of the images from there already. Um, you can choose, uh, you know, sort of what your radius is to, uh, to search. Um, and you can choose sort of the formatting that you want the output in and that sort of thing. Um, anyway, what that will return to you is what data products exist from Aperitif DR1. Um, and so in this case, uh, there are several fields um, and there are data products associated with each field. In this case, uh, in sort of the middle column that's highlighted in blue, you can see that there we produce Q cubes, U cubes, and uh, sorry, this is Stokes Q and Stokes U for those who are familiar, and also uh, Stokes V images. So these are the, the polarization data products. If you were to click on continuum, then you would get continuum images. If you were to click on the H1, then you would get H1 data cubes. Um, and so you can download these directly. Um, there's also, if you, if you let the page load longer than I did, 
Um, you get little previews of what the data products look like in this. Um, and if you're familiar with the with VO tools that exist, you can send this information um, via SAMP to something like um, Topcat, for example, um, and explore and download data through um, through VO tools. Um, in addition, so I should say that the DR1 really, it covers about a thousand square degrees, um, but it's, uh, it's still a bit limited. And so you may find that your source exists within the APT footprint, but um, maybe not all the data products associated with it have reached, have been released. So the data doesn't necessarily reach the full depth, or maybe it's outside of the, the range that's been released. If that's the case, you can also access data via an external collaborator process. And I've been a sponsor for um, several people who have done this, particularly with the H1. Um, you need an Appetit sponsor. So I'm at the IAA. I would be a logical choice where I can also put you in touch with people. Um, in order to, to go through the collaborator process, you basically need to write a proposal describing the project, what your requirements are, what your expected outputs are, and what your contribution would be to Appetit. Um, and then those proposals are considered by the Appetit Survey Executive Committee. Um, and we have a relatively fast uh, response time. I say one week here. Um, it might be a couple weeks, for example, depending on how people are busy and traveling. Um, but uh, I've, wait, we don't travel anymore. It's the pandemic. No, um, uh, I've just uh, put a screenshot of our wiki uh, to demonstrate that um, we have had very successful external collaborations. Um, and it just so happens that the top one is Haley Roberts, who's the same Haley who was here uh, talking a couple weeks ago uh, about OH Mega Mazers. Um, so uh, there is still ongoing work. Um, we are uh, continuing to reduce the last six months of observing um, that was done. Uh, we do this through an automated pipeline at Astron um, that outputs the data products that are then validated by humans and uh, ultimately would be uh, released in a, in a DR. Um, at the IAA here, I'm continuing to conduct H1 source finding. Um, and I'm also actively improving uh, the existing H1 data product pipeline um, through interactions with the SPSRC. Um, and uh, we also have goals of sort of reprocessing um, the data through improved calibration pipelines. I haven't talked too much about the data quality. I've sort of tried to get you more excited about what exists. Um, but uh, we do have issues with sort of very bright continuum sources that then kind of uh, produce issues in adjacent beams and such. And so we are doing fancy stuff like direction dependent calibration in order to try, to try and remove artifacts. And then we believe we can um, ultimately, the vast majority of our data will pass validation and be able to be released. So um, to conclude, Apertif is this really powerful new survey in the Northern Hemisphere. Um, it's got both depth and resolution in continuum polarization and spectral line, uh, H1 spectral line and NOH for that matter. Um, that uh, I hope I've given you a sample of what's there and that you're excited to see if your favorite object lives in the survey. Um, there are these new 3D data visualization tools that are available. They're available at the IAA as well, especially when we get our new laptop, fingers crossed. Um, and they're act under active development um, by our collaborators. Um, and we're really on this brink of, um, uh, you know, making them more relevant. So to be able to do really cool data analysis and interpretation and not just kind of like fly around, fly around data cubes. Um, and the Aperitif data is of course now available through DR1 um, and access to proprietary data is also possible through external cloud.
Yeah, sorry. <clears throat> we have a, another technical problem here. The, the computer shut down because he, he was talking about uh, against personal computers. So <laughs> this is this is the I think it's fine. So come here and, and, and maybe you, you can end the talk here. Uh, so we just do something there because I'm not connected to the yeah. mic. Okay. Yeah, sorry. <clears throat> we have a yeah the presentation is over. So the, the computer shut down because he, he was talking about uh, against personal computers. So <laughs> this is this is the so come here and, and, and maybe you you can end the talk here. Just uh, mute the uh, I think if you mute the YouTube, then it'll be all right. It's mute. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, the presentation is over. So. The, the computer. Oh. He was talking about the gays personal computer. So <laughs> I don't know. Should we kill uh, the YouTube and then? You you are at home now. Mute your. Uh, yeah. I think if you mute the YouTube, then it'll be alright. Yeah. Okay. So. <laughs> I got a Lourdes's computer now. No? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, fine now. All right, okay. so I think it died on the very last slide. Uh, I'm happy to answer questions. <laughs> I had nothing more to say. <laughs> yeah, Teresa. Okay, so this is a fairly simple one. I by the nomenclature of Apatit versus Westerbork. So Apatit is the survey telescope. Okay, so Teresa said that she's a bit uh, confused by the nomenclature because there's Westerbork the telescope and then there's Apatit and it's not entirely clear what that refers to. Um, yes, I agree. Westerbork is the, <laughs> is the telescope with the sort of 14 dishes. Apatit both refers to the phased ray feed instrumentation that was put on the telescopes to upgrade it. Um, and it also refers to the names of the surveys or the prefix of the surveys, if you will. Um, so uh, for the, the wide area, um, we're calling it OZ, the Aperitif Wide Extragalactic Survey. And the medium deep, the name is a bit still sort of up in the air, but we haven't published the paper describing it yet. <laughs> so um, the Aperitif Medium Deep Survey. Pathfinder is listed as Apertif in all the SDA and the Western Pathfinder. So that's why I. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, it's basically the name of the instrument and the shorthand for the surveys. Okay. Thank you. Yes, you're welcome. Uh, other questions? Yeah. Yeah. Two questions. Yeah. What is, what is the frequency range that the Apertif can reach? Because you show the red sheet the OH, but can right. you reach the rest frequency of the OH? Right, so um, the, the question was, what was the frequency range of the, of the surveys? Um, and so for, uh, for the instrument, yeah, yeah, okay. Well, it's kind of uh, also an important distinction. So the instrument can do 300 megahertz. Um, in the first uh, half of the survey, we went from 1430 to, uh, I guess that would be 1130 megahertz but we found that everything past about 1300 megahertz was heavily impacted by RFI. So in the second half of the survey, we actually switched it so we can use the full 300 megahertz band. So now it goes from uh, 1580 to 1280, I believe. Um, and that's so that we can have improved continuum and polarization sensitivity. Um, and it doesn't impact the H1 too much because uh, it was really the RFI that was wiping us out anyway. So, um, so, uh, so we can't get to the rest frequency of OH. Um, we can just see sort of what's red shifted into our band. Yeah. Yeah, Lourdes. <laughs> um, what, um, how do you think that Apertif can prepare after the SDA? Uh, what are the main aspects that you think is helpful? One question and the other is what time 
what is the current instrument that it is better matches other things the ingredients and complementary? Got it. Okay. The first question was, um, what can Aperitif teach us uh, or help us prepare for with the SKA or in what ways can it? Um, I think that um, the biggest ways in which it can help us prepare is uh, learning how to deal with such large data volume and also um, calibration, uh, data calibration challenges. Um, and so it's a good, uh, I think it's a good example of developing workflows for large surveys. Um, and not just in one direction, but also when you realize there are problems and going back and having to re, uh, recalibrate or re-reduce data and also how you store that and how you make it accessible to everyone. Um, I think it has good lessons in that respect. Um, the second question was, uh, what surveys do I think are most complimentary, <clears throat> excuse me, to Aperitif? Um, do you mean in the radio or do you mean in multi -way thing? Um, uh, in, yeah, that's a good question. Um, right. Right. Um, so the follow-up to that was, uh, what radio telescopes would, uh, one want to use in order to follow up to complement Aperitif? Um, I would be particularly interested in FAST. Um, so FAST is the 500 meter aperture something telescope <laughs> um, that's built in China. Um, so it's got very good sensitivity and it's also still in the Northern hemisphere, um, but it's got a large declination range that overlaps with Aperitif. Um, whereas, um, so if you wanna follow up Aperitif detected objects, I think it'd be very interesting to go after them with FAST. Um, to look for really diffuse emission. I am, of course, very biased because I'm interested in the H1. Uh, I don't know what it would be like for the continuum and if it would be as beneficial. Um, but uh, if your study is more interested in, for example, um, population statistics of continuum sources or even of H1 sources, and you want to cover a larger area, then I think Wallaby is a natural extension of the upper teeth because they have similar sensitivity and resolution. Um, yeah. Yes. How to view the core part. Yes, yes. Yeah, okay. So the question was about 3D visualization and how do you view the core of the galaxy when you're um, sort of manipulating the data and rotating it and stuff? Um, there are a couple different ways to do this. Um, if it's not in the VR, but you're using the Slicer Astro, program that is actually on your laptop and you can control the, the levels at which the three-dimensional contours appear and their color and their opacity. Um, and so you could in fact entirely remove the contours associated with the low level emission and you could just look at the contours that are associated with the, with the core if you wanted to. Um, with, the, with the VR headset, you would probably do the equivalent thing by um, basically lowering the, uh, or raising the minimum threshold, um, and sort of playing with the, the scale range within your data set. Yeah, yeah. Another way to do it would sort of be to kind of like you're suggesting, you could manipulate or you could figure out what values are interesting outside of the VR, and then you could apply that within the VR environment to look at the, to highlight the core. Yeah. Um, you can also, uh, the, the VR um, software, iDAV, takes in a FITS cube. Um, and so you can manipulate a FITS cube how you like and then read it into iDAV. So you can sort of um, precondition it a little bit for how you want to view it. Yeah. Yeah, you're welcome. Uh, are there any questions online? Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Amidou, go ahead. 
Yeah, hi, Kelly. Um, great talk. Thanks. Uh, I was wondering, I didn't quite follow, what part of the data is uh, proprietary at the moment? Is it the medium tip or? No, uh, so, um, there are fields. Uh, yeah, I guess I didn't say this explicitly, so I apologize. Um, basically, what is contained within the um, DR1 is any field that's been observed in the first year of observations that also passed uh, uh, data validation. Um, so that includes medium deep survey um, pointings. However, they haven't been combined. So um, you can download all of them, but then you would have to do the combination yourself. Or you walk across the hallway and you talk to me because I can kind of do it as well. <laughs> all right, thanks. I'm, I'm happy to, to help, yeah. Uh, other questions online? Other questions here? Yeah. So uh, using these phase and repeats yeah. uh, provide, uh, provides a uh, obvious advantage when mapping large descriptions of this. But if I'm, if I'm interested in a particular source, is there any penalty in sensitivity over using a typical single picture? No, and in fact, uh, but there are some challenges. Okay, so the question was, um, uh, the advantages of the paths are very um, evident in terms of being able to map large fields of view. However, um, is there any uh, advantage or penalty um, as doing it that way as compared to imaging a single object um, with a single pixel uh, instrument? Um, so sort of what, what um, Westerbork had before the, the phase array feeds. Um, and the answer is uh, there's no penalty. Uh, in fact, it's in some ways easier to do it with the single, for, for an individual object, it's easier to do it with the single pixel feed. And the reason is that that can be cryogenically cooled, whereas the phase array feeds are currently not. So your system temperature is higher, which means you have to observe longer to get to the same sensitivity. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So, um, however, if you are want to look at lots of individual objects, then it might be more efficient to go area and just stare at them longer as opposed to doing many pointings. Yeah. Uh, other questions? Um, I could give it another minute, but... Um, Otherwise, if not, I'm in the C building here at the IAA, and I'm happy to answer more questions um, about Aperitif, about uh, my science, about uh, SPSRC or SKA coordination related things. Um, yeah, uh, I encourage you, if, uh, if you think Aperitif is uh, potentially interesting for your science, then the first stop is to go and look at DR1 and see if you can find your objects. And if not, and you would like a little help, um, please uh, come to me. I'm more than happy to try and enable your science through through like the external collaborator process, for example. So thank you very much. Well, thank you, Kelly. And we close here the talk. Uh. <laughs> okay.